Hello, everybody. I wanted to welcome you to this week's podcast and say that you have a lot to look forward to. Today, we have a really mm, heart centric guest with us. We have Sajo Popham, who is an herbalist, but he's not a typical herbalist. He is a prolific, multi layered herbalist who has studied tons of ancient systems and bringing that together in a practical, nurturing way, touching lots of people out in Ashland, Oregon. And I'm going to share with you before we begin the interview and before I uh, get Sage to say hello, I'm going to share with you that because he has the privilege of living in paradise away from cell towers and all of that, the sound and the video may have a couple of little glitches, so we ask your forgiveness on that, and that you focus on all of the gorgeous heart and information that Seja will share with us today. I'm going to share, well, let me just say hi, Seja, before I jump into telling people how we met. Hey. Hey, Ron, how are you? Thanks so much for having me on your show. So great to have you. I uh, look forward to this and having the people who love the approach that I share. I saw how much you touched me when we met, and I knew that it would be a perfect fit. So I'm going to tell all of you briefly, I was just at a convention called PLF Live. It equals Product Launch Formula Live. It's an entrepreneurial convention that teaches those of us who are creating online businesses how to do it most effectively so that we can reach you with all that we're bringing you every week. And so at that convention, there were probably a thousand people and a handful between five and 10 stood out to me in distinct ways during the three days. It was like they had a spotlight on them. And I had managed to synchronistically run into every single one of them, except for Seja and his wife, Whitney. And then my friend said, oh, I met this really cool woman named Shannon, and she's invited us to a final dinner. I show up, and the universe handed me this final piece that was the perfect close to our three days. And we had a gorgeous evening of sharing and inspiring and supporting one another, which is how I think we can live our lives every day. So I met Asia and Whitney and I was like, I really, really, really want to be more connected. And I really want to introduce you to my audience. So literally less than two weeks later, here is Seja. So, um, I would love to start this whole thing by hearing a little bit about you, your story, how you got drawn into herbs and the magic healing power of nature. We'll start there. Mm. Yeah. Well, once again, thanks so much for having me here, Ron. I really appreciate the, the opportunity uh, to be with you here. And um, yeah, you know, for me, it's interesting. My my path into herbal medicine was not, um, you know, the way I think a lot of people think of it is, uh, you know, I wasn't raised by hippie parents. I wasn't raised out in the wilderness. You know, I was raised in a pretty conventional, um, you know, middle class suburban environment. And um, throughout my life, I really had uh, spent a lot of time in the natural world and really felt this deep, deep connection to the forests and the fields and the mountains and the rivers and just the wildness of the world. And all my life, I wanted to be a doctor, but uh, something inside of myself just didn't feel resonant with the more conventional uh, allopathic path of medicine. And uh, <clears throat> while I was living in Southern California after high school, I, I had come across this um, article actually on naturopathic medicine and I remember seeing those two words naturopathic medicine next to each other and it just this light bulb went off inside of me that I didn't even realize there was this natural systems of medicine and so that really led me towards studying plants I ultimately attended Bastyr University uh, and did their herbal sciences program 
and really going deep into the science of herbal medicine and how they affect our biochemistry and our physiology and all the really hard sciences behind plants. But you know, before I was an herbalist, I first and foremost considered myself to be a spiritual seeker. You know, I really wanted to know who I am and why I'm here and what life is and what what is this what is this that that we're here to do and what is the what is spirituality and mysticism and our own connection with those divine principles of life. And during my time at Bastyr, I, those, that spiritual side of my life and the scientific side of my life felt almost at war with one another in myself and my heart and in my mind. And so that ultimately led to me really seeking how to bring those two together. How do we have a universal system of not just plant medicine, but just an understanding of life that can bring these seemingly contradictory models together into a cohesive system. And that ultimately led me to travel all across the world to study different traditional models of spirituality and medicine from Ayurveda and Chinese medicine to medical astrology, alchemy, folk traditions. And ultimately that, that has led to me kind of creating this model of plant medicine that is equally able to address the science and the spirit of people and plants and and in that way we can work with herbal medicines in a way that doesn't just you know take our symptoms away like i think a lot of people tend to think of herbal medicines but that we can interface with the plant kingdom in a way that facilitates the deeper level of healing a level of healing that touches the level of the solution of our consciousness um, so that is loosely what I refer to as uh, evolutionary herbalism. Yeah, since I didn't introduce the name of your school out there in Ashland, it is the School of Evolutionary Herbalism. And I think that combining all of those ancient systems moving forward and how it's all evolved and how we're learning now to take advantage of all of those ancient systems, awakening and deepening ourselves, makes it a perfect name for all that you offer. I wanna to respond to a couple of things that you said in that answer. The fact that you wanted to be a doctor, which is ultimately wanting to be a healer, being attracted to wanting to help others and to show up to create an enhancement in people's lives. And I think it's so great that you found a distinct way to do that, a distinct way that allowed perhaps an even deeper healing. I believe, as my people know that watch and tune in all the time, I believe that one of the main reasons we're here is to create a deeper intimacy with ourselves, with one another, and then with life itself. And so what better way to do that third piece than to be connecting to nature and to plants and to find out that we're interdependent in every way, right from breathing and breathing out our carbon dioxide and they breathe out the oxygen. And I love how we have been made interdependent with nature. And you have emerged mm -hmm. that in a way that very few people uh, have either got time or have imagined doing. So I look forward to hearing tons more of that journey. So yeah. the next piece that I'd like to ask you is about your wife. I had the privilege of meeting Whitney when we were out at the convention. And as it turns out, you both are on a similar path, if I understood it correctly, and that you do this school together. I think that I get so many questions from people about, what do I do if I'm on a conscious path and my partner is not necessarily wanting to work on him or herself and mm. because half of my clients are men i word it that way it's not always the woman who is doing the exploration as is evidenced by you but mm. to have that journey with someone and to deepen and build such a vision together i'd love to hear how you met a little bit of what her story might be and then how you've deepened this vision together Mm, yeah. Well, I really appreciate you asking that question because 
I tend to be a little bit more of the face in our work and she sometimes tends to be a little bit more behind the scenes. She's starting to uh, be more in the, in the uh, front side of our teachings, which is really exciting. Um, but I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about my wife because she's amazing and none of what we do would be possible without her. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we were brought together by the plants. We were brought together through um, herbal medicine and that, that interest is, is how we were brought together through, um, through a similar teacher that we were working with at the time. And um, so I really see that it was, <clears throat> it was the plants themselves that, that brought us together and our, both of our paths just kind of crossed and then came together in, uh, in a, a really beautiful way. And, um, you know, her background is also in herbal medicine and, um, you know, her story is a little different from mine, you know, it's a lot of, for her, it was her own healing process in her body, uh, healing her mind and her spirit, you know, too, and the ways that, and I think all of us have this, we all have, you know, and for myself too, it's like, we all have this wound that we carry. And, uh, I think a lot of the reason we come into this life is to heal that wound. And for both of us, it was the plants <clears throat> that were able to provide that, that medicine to heal those deeper wounds that we carry. And so that's a lot of her journey with the plants has been her own healing process. And then through the healing that she received and getting this, this vision, this calling to provide that healing to other people. And, uh, and that's what she does in an incredibly beautiful way. So, yeah, you know, in terms of the question of, <clears throat> you know, couples and maybe one being on a spiritual path and one not having that calling, um, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that because w my, my wife and I have, have always been so in alignment, you know, and, and, and similar in our perspective and perception of life and of nature and, and, and of the spiritual side of things. But um, yeah, for me, it's, it's this learning how to um, see things through different perspectives because she sees and understands things one way and I see and understand things how on the surface they look very different, but when we really get to a deeper level that there's a similarity there, that there's a, that there's a, a a golden thread that weaves those seemingly different perspectives together. And, uh, and that has been a lot of our work in, in herbal traditions as well. But sometimes you look at Ayurveda and the Greek and the Greek tradition, and they seem really different in things, just in a different language. And uh, so, yeah, it's been a really incredibly beautiful journey and challenging journey as well uh, to, to be working with someone so closely that, um, you know, I'm also married to. So it's, uh, it's good work, though, you know, it's like they're good challenges to have, because we're all about doing whatever we can do to be of service to the world and to, to be uh, contributing to the betterment of humanity uh, through our own unique approach, which is through the, the medicinal plants. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I loved right away in our meeting out in uh, Phoenix was that we speak a very similar language and seem to have a very similar approach to things. A couple of examples from what you just shared. For you to say we all carry a wound, and then you talked about challenges. How I view it is that our souls evolve by establishing challenges and then learning how to face them and resolve them. It challenges yeah. us deeper, to look deeper into ourselves, to look deeper to one another. And we learn how to come together in a mutual support as we face those challenges. So often it seems to me people see their challenges as life kicking their butt and they feel like life is not on their side somehow. But I like to view it as literally it's the curriculum of first grade. You had to face the challenge of yeah. learning to read and learning to write and learning to all the things you learn in addition to learning how to be away from home. These are all challenges, but we have somehow embraced them as acceptable challenges within a structure. Well, I think all challenges are that and that your soul attracts to you the various challenges and your particular souls wanted to face a great deal of that journey through plants. 
I love how there are an infinite number of ways to approach our various challenges, but it's so important that we have conversations that allow that we can talk about our wounding, and that there is no fear and shame in talking about that, and that when we come together, a part of the healing is talking about it. So I didn't want to let that little moment pass by without a chance to um, nurture it just a little bit and make it perhaps in some people's minds a little safer to have that process. It seems to me, and I know we're going to get into this later in this conversation, but it seems to me that a lot of people just want to get rid of the challenge, get rid of the symptom, rather than saying, wait a minute, this is a messenger that's trying to get you to look somewhere to nurture something in yourself and therefore to get rid of it is not the goal. To nurture and resolve it and learn about yourself and one another, so much more appealing. So anyway, I jump yeah. as with enthusiasm like I know you do from our sharing before. So I thank you for sharing yeah. that and for including Whitney. Um, for those of you who want to go to their website, evolutionaryherbalism.com, another thing that I know that Whitney, Sage's wife, has done is create a bunch of the vision or the, the visual artistry of the website, which is absolutely beautiful. I wrote to her and said, I'm so impressed. I felt that the site just visually was healing and nurturing. So anyway, I wanted to give her that shout out before we moved on. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, well, it looks way better than when I built the website. <laughs> it was pretty plain on my side. <laughs> uh, thank goodness we all have our gifts and we enhance each other's gifts. <laughs> so yeah. I'm curious if there is something here, I didn't ask you about this prior to the interview. I'm curious what kind of a space you guys have is it a farm? Do you grow tons of your own herbs? I want to hear a little bit about the magic and the paradise that so many of us don't get to live in that you may be very well be immersed in. Yeah, well, we, <clears throat> we live on, um, in, a, in, a, in a valley outside of uh, Ashland, Oregon called the Applegate Valley. And uh, our home is on, we're very blessed to be caretakers of 120 acres of property out here. Wow. Um, and, um, yeah, where this is where we, where we live and where we work and where we teach. So we actually do a lot of our work out of, uh, out of yurts. Um, so I, we actually, um, have our, our medicine making space, our lab where we do all of our alchemical, um, prep medicine preparations called spagyrics, uh, out of a, a 30 foot yurt. And then we also have another 30 foot yurt where we teach all of our workshops, and uh, where I uh, hunker down to work on my book, and um, and uh, yeah, we we do grow some some food and some vegetables and things like that. I wouldn't necessarily say we have a farm per se. Um, we're working very hard to get it to that point, um, but 120 acres is a lot of land to steward, and there's always more work than time. So, um, but we are definitely working towards. You know, for for me, it's like my vision is not is, is like herbal medicine is is a critical component of it but to me there's a bigger vision for me that is involves like learning how to live on this mother earth in a way that we can actually give back more than we take because you know it's something i've been writing about in my book actually which is that you know the way i see it it's like there's this almost the spiritual sickness present in humanity that sees us as separate from nature. And it's that illusion, this enchantment that, that we have that sees that we're, that the human being is somehow not a part of the natural world that has led to, I think, a lot of the major issues that we're facing on the earth at this time. And so for me, I'm really trying to learn myself how to, 
how to just be a, be a good human, you know, how to be a part of this ecosystem, how to, how to nourish myself from the land, how to take care of the water, how to take care of the plants, how to take care of myself, how to create not just a sustainable system, but something that's beyond sustainability, where we're actually nourishing the earth, because I think that's what's so required of us to be doing right now as human beings and how to, how to, how to like completely rearrange our paradigm so that the world that we create can be in alignment with the earth that we live on. Cause right now the world and the earth are, are not <laughs> congruent with one another. So, um, so that's a, just kind of a little bit about the vision that I'm, I'm trying to create out here in our home and, and, and with the land and such. Yeah, I think what you have mentioned is huge and important. And whew, we live in a world where there's a, a whole system of people stuck in the womb, to keep the theme consistent, stuck in the womb of not trusting life so that they're stuck in a, I don't trust that my needs can be met and it leads to a lack of knowing how to value anything around. It's like, I have to take care of me because I don't trust life. And so our governments, and we're seeing all kinds of conflicts in this kind of arena. So I think it is vital that people like you start to bring practical ways that more people can nurture their space and nurture the earth because my goodness gracious, it's like this mother energy that's holding us all. And like wounded children, we don't consider mother's needs. Well, you can only do that for so long. And I think it is vital in our healing, in our learning yeah. to nurture ourselves and one another, that we include nurturing the earth in a big way. So I yeah. thank you for what you're doing in a, in, in a, rather profound level that I can't quite quantify. <laughs> yeah, it's Thank you. so important. Um, so if you don't grow all of your herbs, I want, let me back up for a second. I basically want this conversation with you and I to address people who are new at herbs, people who are mm. more involved in herbs, and then people who are actually herbalists because mm. there are so many people at different levels that end up listening. And yeah. one of the first things that I would say for people who want to get involved in a more natural, proactive approach to their health, having just some basic clear answers about herbs and how, or plants, it's not just herbs, uh, plants and how they touch us and impact us. I even want to go to such a practical place as since you can't provide for everyone listening in various parts of the world, the herbs they might need somewhere in this conversation, I'd love for you to share if there's a company that you suggest for people to go to get herbs that are extracted and formulated in a way that is truly healthy that you support. So somewhere in there, if you could get that in, that would be really great. Yeah. Uh, anything yeah. you want to say about that right now, or should I move on to another question and to keep it in mind? Well, well yeah. I mean, I, just while, it's, while my mind is there, you know, I mean, I think one of the, one of the critical things about um, herbal medicine is that it, it's that we, you know, we all, hmm, I'm trying to think of a simple way of putting this, that, <clears throat> so wherever, wherever it is that we live, we're exposed to certain uh, ecological dynamics, weather patterns, seasonal changes, um, you know, we're exposed to this particular kind of environment, which directly impacts our physiological, psychological, emotional well-being and health. And so from a lot of herbalist perspectives, there's a potency and a power to working with the herbs that grow 
in your immediate environment because they're exposed to the same ecological factors and dynamics that you are. <clears throat> and so that's one thing I always like to encourage with people, especially people that are just getting started in herbal medicine to get outside into their backyard and maybe get a simple botanist that can start introducing them to their, the, the medicines that grow immediately around them because <clears throat> there's something very empowering about stepping outside into the forest and being able to know what plants grow in your local bioregion, how you can use them as a medicine. And there's something just very empowering about that of like, we're talking about this connection to the earth that it's like, all of a sudden you go through a forest and you're surrounded by these friends that you you're getting to know and that you learn and you know how, how they function and how they can help you and how you can use them to help your friends and your family. And to me, I think that's one of the, the best places to begin on the plant path is to just begin to open up your senses, your awareness, to the plants that grow around you because now you're establishing a relationship with your local ecosystem and that starts to build your confidence and connection to to the earth that uh, the to the unique little pocket of earth that you live on yeah if i may make a suggestion based on what you just said perhaps if those of you listening go to evolutionaryherbalism.com and see some of the courses that Seja offers and you can start to get educated or join their newsletter and start to get educated about some of the plants and herbs. And then you can look up, even on the internet, what plants and herbs are indigenous to your area. And then you can use what you're learning from Seja and Whitney and apply it as it's right in your backyard, which I absolutely love. Uh, I had heard an example that when we buy honey, that we should go and get local honey because it's been connecting to all of the plants and things that are already mm, more immediate to our physical bodies. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So, getting to the courses and the things that you offer and giving you a chance to share some of your beautiful knowledge with the people who are listening. If you go and look at their website, there is such a broad array of approaches that are all applied to plants. For those of you who love astrology, I had never even heard this before but they offer courses that are about medical astrology and how the planets and the movements of planets impact us in a particular way. There is a connection to Kabbalah, for those of you who may not know that term, like I was gonna also ask you to explain yurt, because there are a lot of people who may not know what a yurt is as well, but even Kabbalah, which is an ancient, uh, system most people associate with he the Hebrew religion that is so remarkable in its understanding of life and how it works. So many of these systems, have uh, Seja has explored and brings it right into how all of these systems complement one another. We're gonna tell you very soon about a, a free uh, online course, a mini course, he calls it many, but it's three hours of generous teaching that he is offering. And we'll get to that in a minute. But all of these things coming together and how many systems support the same healing journey, which I think is profound. So yeah. Yeah. within all of that, <laughs> um, going and applying it to where you are in the world, wherever you're listening and seeing what is immediate, I think is a great suggestion. So why don't we start with helping people understand your approach to plants. I know that you've talked about the difference between an allopathic model mm -hmm. and a holistic model. We throw around the term holistic a lot, 
but if you could start and just share with us what you mean by holistic and how that contrasts with allopathic, I'd love to hear that, and I know people would too. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> well, but before I jump into that, I just wanted to mention one quick little thing about what you were mentioning about the, the, the way in which my approach is, is integrating these seemingly different traditional models. And, you know, to me, when we're looking at these different traditions of plant medicine or spirituality, whether we're talking about the Vedic tradition or the Chinese Taoist tradition or, you know, the Greek tradition or Unani Tib medicine, which is the Arabic system or North American traditions of herbalists and indigenous folk traditions, whatever we're talking about, you know, these traditional people ultimately their systems and their knowledge, their understanding of plants and of people and of the natural world was all founded upon their following of what, what in the West they refer to as the light of nature, right? The, or nature Sophia, the, the underlying intelligence of the natural world and that traditional peoples were able to, to learn about the plants from the plants themselves, right? That there was a, a different mode of cognition and perception that they had, that they weren't living so much in their linear analytical minds, but they were more able to perceive through a radically different perceptual faculty than most modern humans live. Because you ask most modern humans, where's their consciousness? And they point to their head. We talk to, you know, traditional type people and oftentimes they point to their heart when they talk about how they perceive the world and so that's one of the things is that on this foundational intelligence of herbal medicine and so that is kind of one of my core orientations in the work that I do is that nature is alive and intelligent and conscious and sentient and that we as human beings are a part of that and have the ability to learn directly from that. It just requires that we shift how we perceive the lens through which we perceive the world. Uh, it's reordered. And that really, that shift from the mind into the heart is really reflective of the difference between an allopathic versus a vitalist or holistic approach to herbal medicine. And you know, a lot of people, <clears throat> tend to have this, you know, carry this, this idea that, um, you know, if we use herbs or vitamins or minerals or supplements or home homeopathic remedies, that that immediately equates to being holistic in our approach to health. And what I generally like to say is that Holistic medicine isn't necessarily what kind of medicine that we use, it's rather how we use the medicines that we use. Whether that's an herb or a over-the-counter drug or a pharmaceutical drug or a vitamin or a mineral or whatever form it takes, that it's not what the medicine is, it's how we use that medicine. And um, a lot of people don't, I don't think a lot of people really understand that plants can be used in, in an allopathic context, meaning that the, the symptoms in the body are actually suppressed, that we aren't getting to the root causes of the problem, but rather just treating the peripheral symptom or peripheral expressions of the disease. You know, a great example that I like to use of that is turmeric, right? That turmeric is a very popular herb right now, right? Because it's, quote, good for inflammation. And I think that um, phrase, good for, is, can be a really good indication for when we might be next. Now, of course, it's useful to know what types of symptoms and conditions a plant can be remedial for, but there's deeper levels of understanding that an herbalist needs to, to know about. about turmeric. It's like, yeah, term, you know, say turmeric is used for inflammatory type conditions. And while we're seeing it through chemical constituents that decrease inflammatory pathways in the body, um, that's all very useful. But what is 
oftentimes overroach to a plant is the traditional understanding of different aspects of a plant, such as its energetics. And so we see that, you know, turmeric might not be suitable for certain types of people. You know, if you eat some turmeric root, you immediately notice that it's very, very warming, that it's very drying, your mouth gets really dry. And maybe people that have a really warm and dry constitution, it's not suitable for them. It's not, um, it doesn't match the unique concept shifting from this allopathic model into a holistic model requires that we start to look at the, the wholeness see that a plant isn't just its chemistry right that there's a lot more to an herbal medicine than just its chemical constituents and there's a lot more to a person than just their primary complaint of the headache or the joint pain or the back pain or the I can't sleep at night, that they have a, a heart, they have a mind, they have a spirit, they have this soul, this, you know, things that they're trying to grow and develop in themselves. Working with herbal medicines in a holistic context, I think it's very important that we don't tunnel kind of pull back and remember the wholeness of that person and their life and, and how it's immediately and directly influencing their overall state of health or lack of health. Um, so yeah, those are just kind of some of my thoughts on allopathic and holistic herbalism because I think it's really important because um, because if we, we want to have an integrative model, right, that I think science has a whole lot to teach us. Like we know so much about medicinal plants through science and it's incredibly valuable and helpful, but I don't think we should abandon thousands of years of um, tradition in favor of the bright, shiny, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies of science. <laughs> yeah. So a couple of things that I'd like to comment or reiterate that you just said. First, let me say to everyone, thank you for your patience with the sound and the video. It will occasionally have little glitches, so thank you again for that patience. It is well worth it to get the gems that will be passed on. Um, the first thing that I'd like to comment on is pointing to the head for where consciousness is versus the heart for where consciousness is centered. Again, you and I are on the same path. We just have unique tools we use to get people there. One of the main things that I do with my clients within the first few months of working with me is teach them how to come out of what I call the observation deck of life and how to come down and literally be in the center of their being, which is here, which is the only place you're gonna create intimacy with yourself or with life and so it is so important and when we come down here to the heart it doesn't remotely imply that we lose our intelligence on any level it is actually right. quite enhanced and so i love this pointing out the difference between the two and people often throw it out but don't really talk about it so again we're on the same page the second thing just because the sound was a little wacky as you shared the example you gave of turmeric being great for um, inflammation, well, if you happen to have a really warm and uh, I think you said moist, what did you say? Warm and dry. Warm and dry, there warm you go. And dry. One of those two. Yeah. Warm and dry constitution, yeah. if you happen to have those yeah. issues already in the way your body processes, this might actually exacerbate your problem, not actually help it. So I love that you are so thorough rather than just yeah. kind of one size fits all. It's good for inflammation, done. Which is what you meant by holistic as one part of the holistic. And I love yeah. that. I just wanted to make sure that was really clear to listeners based on what was happening a little with the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the, one, well, the other thing I thought I would mention about that too is like, <clears throat> for me, I tend to think of plants a lot like people. And, you know, when we're first getting to know a person, 
It's not like, like when we first met a few weeks ago, right? It wasn't like, hey, Ron, how you doing? My name's Sage. Hi, Sage. My name's Ron. Oh, nice to meet you, Ron. So uh, what are you good for? Right? Like, we don't interact with people like that. But that's the way it's very common for people to interact with plants. Oh, turmeric. Oh, that's interesting. What's it good for? It's like, for me, I'm not concerned so much about what a, what, what a plant is good for, but rather who that plant is and why that plant might be good for certain types of symptoms and diseases like that gets those kinds of questions the the how and the why and the who of the plant gets much deeper into our understanding of herbal medicines than just the superficial what is that plant good for so i just wanted to mention that real quick too no i think it's awesome um where I do want to jump now is telling people about the opportunity. The timing for this particular conversation with Seja is so right on the money because only once a year do they offer this three hour free mini course on an introduction to what life is like as an herbalist. It even goes into how someone might want to create a career out of being an herbalist. It, I have watched already what it is that he's going to be launching in this next, actually since we're gonna be showing this on the 13th of May, that he's launching right now as we speak. <laughs> and I will make sure that all of you have a link below this video and I'll email you as well to make sure that you have access to getting these three hours of free education. It is great for you no matter what your interest is in herbs, whether you're more a beginner or whether you're all the way over here into wanting to enhance your career as an herbalist. Some really practical, beautiful things that Seja has plenty of time to flesh out and make clear. So, that course, uh, let, let's uh, give them just a little bit of a taste of what is coming. And if you could yeah. talk a little bit more about the energy of plants, the energetics of plants, or even the six qualities that they tend to impact in the body, giving us a starting place of what people might expect in this three hour course. Sure. Yeah. Well, this um, this particular mini course is called Vitalist or the Vitalist Herbalism Mini Course, and um, what we see in traditions of of herbalism across the world, east, west, north, south, anywhere across the world, is they had what we would refer to as a vitalist understanding of life, a way of seeing nature and people and plants through, as I was speaking of earlier, through this lens of that there is an underlying intelligence, there's an underlying, um, does things with purpose and with consciousness and with meaning. And so through that lens of understanding, we see, I love that you mentioned earlier that, that you know, when we're getting those challenges in life, that it's a message, it's a communication. And I think that's one of the, that's a very vitalist understanding of things that when we get sick, when we have a symptom in our body, it's the messenger. It's a communication showing us that some way that we're living is in or with them. And so... <clears throat> Uh, this vitalist model of understanding has unfortunately been abandoned in the last few hundred years as the scientific model has become more deeply ingrained into our systems of medicine. And so this is a calling to revive <clears throat> this more traditional understanding of people and plants and nature and to not have to abandon the science, but to bring those two together, this vitalist model. And through that vitalist model, we begin to see plants in a very different way. And I, and I briefly mentioned that with the example of turmeric earlier, where we don't just see that there's these, uh, you know, curcumin constituents that are very anti-inflammatory, 
but we get into a deeper level of understanding the, the vital force within the plant and how that vital force, that vital intelligence within the plant influences the vital intelligence of the body. And traditional models of medicine really see the human organism as not a gear or a machine or just a linear reductionistic slew of biochemical processes, but rather they see the human organism as an ecosystem. They see the human organism as a microcosm of nature, that all of the, the forces of the natural world are directly reflected and embodied within our whole our holistic being and so in that way they had a certain way of understanding the nature of our body based on uh, ecological dynamics it's more of an ecological model of physiology and through that they saw the way that when they would introduce a plant into the body they saw it as the plant shifting the ecological terrain of our system. And the way that's typically done in, in traditions of herbalism is that they see these three primary dynamics of what we refer to as energetics. And just to clarify, when I say energetics, I'm not necessarily speaking about um, a, a, a kind of like an etheric uh, spiritual dynamic. Um, we're really speaking, when we speak of the energy of an herb, we're really speaking to a very pragmatic, practical way of understanding its physiological property. And that's typically associated with the temperature of the plant, which can be hot or cold, uh, the moisture of the plant, whether it's cooling or drying, and the, tone, the tonal quality of the plant, whether it kind of tightens and firms things up or whether it relaxes different types of tissues. And this correlates directly to how we experience things in our body, right? That we can have conditions that have a lot of heat or a lot of cold, a lot of wet or a lot of dry, a lot of tension or a lot of relaxation. I think one of the first area, the easiest areas to see this actually is in a cough, right? It's like we've all heard someone that's got a cough and it, you can hear that the lungs are just dry and, you know, they lay down to sleep and they can't stop coughing and everything feels tight and constricted in their chest and they're coughing and coughing and coughing so hard they're popping ribs out of place, you know, and it feels all, they take a breath in and the tissues get all irritated and, and, and overstimulated, right? Well, that's a classic example of what we, were, we would refer to as a hot, dry, tense cough right? So that's kind of the, the ecology of the respiratory system. And if we were to introduce an herbal medicine, say oregano or thyme or elecampane or osha, these are all very pungent, warming, stimulating, drying plants. If someone was to take an herb like that, it's going to really aggravate their condition, right? Rather, we would want to bring in a remedy that's cooling and moistening and soothing and relaxing, something like marshmallow root or licorice root. Um, we've all heard someone with the cold, phlegmy, damp cough, right, where they cough and you can just hear it gurgling and bubbling and they're coughing up all of this mucus and it's just, you know, you can see that it's just very wet in there. And we want to administer a very different kind of remedy. So it's this, this ecological model of physiology couples with herbal energetics in a way that we get incredibly specific for what herb is going to actually be effective for what kind of person. Because in an allopathic model of herbals, they say, oh, you have bronchitis or you have a cough. Um, we need to give them an expectorant remedy for the lungs. And you get this huge list of herbs that are, quote, good for a cough. But you'll see the osha and the marshmallow right next to each other. And so you kind of, a lot of people just kind of like, well, I guess I'll just pick some and hope they work. And I always say it's better to be a, a, a well-informed strategic herbalist and not just base our therapeutic strategies off of 
guessing and hoping that the herbs we give are going to work. And so this ultimately gives us a deeper understanding of, of how a plant is going to influence a person in a very specific way. And, and to just to mention, while this energetics and ecological physiology is a very traditional understanding of plant medicine, it's not antithetical to modern pharmacology, right? So these energetic qualities of plants are directly linked to their chemistry, right? So the, the modern science of plant chemistry and how they uh, impact the body is just a way of, a different way of describing um, and showing how plants have had their influences that ancient people have been talking about for a very long time. It is clear to anyone who listens to you share and teach what a wonderful body of information and what a deep level of intelligence you bring to what you do. What I love is that in this mini course that you're about to offer, that you also hone everything down to very simple, clear systems, such as the six qualities like the dry or moisture, the heating or the cooling, the toning or the relaxing. I love how you provide all of those charts that make everything simple and clear no matter what level people happen to be at in their exploration of herbs at this point. So as I've said, I will send that away for everyone listening to be able to access that free mini course. And how I'd love to close this is just to help people from this point forward in their lives. Do you recommend that people wait until they have an issue, such as a cough, to stick with this same example you gave? Or do you recommend that people become proactive in supporting their system and working with someone such as a naturopath or an herbalist like yourself? To me, they're basically the same thing, but that's just perhaps my naivete. But that kind of thing to be a more proactive, ongoing support and preventative. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think this is one of the areas of herbal medicine that is uh, incredibly unique and really powerful as compared to a more modern approach to medicine, which is, you know, when you get sick, you go to the doctor and you get a pill to take the symptom away and make you feel better. And what we see in a lot of traditional models of healing is that the doctors were paid to keep you healthy. And then when you got sick, they treated you for free. And so it was a whole paradigm shift of medicine that's focused on health rather than focused on disease. And that's what we see in modern medicine is that it's disease treatment, not health enhancing. And I think this is one of the incredible facets of plant medicine is that we, you know, herbal medicines have different levels of strength that they have. You know, some herbs are you know, really, really strong and you, you know, really only want to use them in maybe lower doses and short-term periods of time for the treatment of a specific type of problem. But there are other types of medicines that are more mild that, you know, kind of tread that boundary between, you know, a medicinal remedy and a food, you know, we have things like dandelion leaves and nettle leaves and alfalfa and all these herbs that are incredibly nutritive and mineral rich and can fill in nutrient deficiencies that we can use herbs to just maintain the balance in our constitution, right? Maybe, maybe we don't have a symptom or a disease, but yeah, maybe uh, we feel a little dried out. Maybe our joints are really popping and clicking and we feel a little stiff and we can integrate herbs to help to balance that ecosystem in our body and use the herbs to shift our constitution, to shift our internal state in order to prevent disease from ever occurring, right? And I think that's one of the powers of herbal medicine is that we can use them as a preventative means as well as, as a therapeutic means. Um, you know, the, the other element of this work for me and, you know, just in my 
personal philosophy and approach is that these plants don't just influence our bodies and that, you know, that our bodies and our psyches and our souls aren't really separate. It's like I said, the body and the psyche and the soul, but those like ands in between them make them seem like they're these separate things, but they're not. It's like, we're a whole, we're a whole being, we're an organic unity and that the body is just the most fixed aspect of the soul. And the soul is just the most volatile aspect of the body, but they're two sides of the same leaf. They're not separate. And so when we're treating the body, we're treating the psyche and we're treating the soul and vice versa. And so to me, it's like, even if we're symptom free, like we feel pretty good in our bodies, we can still utilize these plants to facilitate in the development of our consciousness. It's like, we all have certain ways of thinking, certain patterns of feeling that, you know, maybe we'd like to change, right? Maybe we want to feel and think a little differently. Maybe we want to develop certain parts of ourselves. Maybe we want to express ourselves better. Or maybe we want to feel more courageous and empowered and confident in ourselves. Or maybe we want to feel, you know, more clear in our minds and work on our goals and dreams and aspirations. Uh, maybe we want to work on our relationships and having more health and harmony in our relationships. We all, the point is, we all have work to do on ourselves. And I think that's why we have come here on this earth is to heal and to grow and develop on the level of the soul. And that these medicinal plants are the living healing intelligence of the earth. And that when we interface with them in this deeper way, they have the ability to touch our lives and to be that point of contact between ourselves and that medicinal intelligence of the earth. And through that, heal on this deeper level to bring about a level of transformational healing. And I think that that is what's needed on the planet at this time. You know, I don't think we need a model of medicine that is just focused on putting band-aids on symptoms that people, people don't want to just be symptom free. I think people feel that they need a deeper level of healing that there is, as I mentioned earlier, this, this spiritual sickness in the world that we are disconnected from the earth. And I believe that medicinal plants have the ability to be that bridge that connects the humanity back to the earth in a healing way that can re reassemble the wholeness of the soul and the spirit and the body. And in that way, contribute to creating a paradigm that is more healthy and more harmonious and, um, and I think that is why I believe herbal medicine is incredibly relevant, but uh, herbal medicine used in this more holistic context, not just in that kind of limited um, allopathic context. So to me, it's all about the facilitating in the, this, this growth and that we can use plants in that way for on that spiritual side of, of ourselves too. Couldn't agree more with everything that you've shared the whole time we've been talking. A couple of closing thoughts to affirm what you've just shared. In case plants are new to some of you who are listening, or you've just dabbled, I'll give you an example from my own life that I began to see a natural path for the first time about three months ago. And I was pleasantly affirmed that that was a healthy choice for me. I was symptom free, but I just knew somehow that my internal needed some extra support. And so when I went within days, my digestive system as an example, became picture perfect for the model that we hear described. And I go back every few weeks just to see what adjustments we wanna make. And I'm gonna do that just for three, four months, getting myself aligned on the inside. I also, once that was happening so successfully for me, 
I brought my young niece to come and see this natural path. She had a certain issue she was working on and was doing it with the doctor allopathic model of just trying to get rid of the symptoms and it wasn't helping. And she came and got a different regimen of herbs and literally within a week, the inner source level of transformation naturally impacted the symptom but she also said how much better she felt. So I use these two examples to affirm, please go and check out what Sage and Whitney are doing. It's a beautiful place to land with someone who's so willing and clear and heart-centric, as I said at the beginning. I know that they will be generous in bringing you into their community of people that they guide and nurture. And so the final thing I'll say from my end is addressing what you said is what the world, the planet needs. I have been sharing since the early 1990s that our planet is in an unprecedented time of acceleration and transformation. That energy shift is not just happening outside us. It is impacting us all so directly, and our bodies are being asked to assimilate higher levels of energy than what we've mm. ever been used to. And what better way than to use plants, which are also high vibrational and natural, to give your body the support that it needs. So I couldn't be more grateful for the work that you do, Seja. I couldn't be more grateful that you took time out of your very busy pre-launch time for this course that they're about to put out, again, that I will tell you all about and make sure you have access. And so I thank you for being here. Anything you would like to say in closing for everyone? Oh, well, I just want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time to, to talk with me, Ron. And I just... Uh, yeah, I just really uh, want to uh, just acknowledge and appreciate the work that you're doing too, you know, and just to me, it's like, this is, this is what it's all about is, is this outreach and communication and expression and just sharing and collaborating and trying to get, and this is what I encourage everyone listening to is like finding that thing inside of your own heart and your own mind that has deep meaning and deep purpose that can have a positive influence on the world. Maybe it's just in yourself. Maybe it's just in your family. Maybe it's just in your friends and community. It doesn't mean you have to be out there on a pedestal preaching to the whole world. Yeah. It's like when we're all doing our own internal work and healing ourselves, that the ripple effect of that is so incredible. And that when we all do that on a larger scale, I think that's when we can tilt the scales in a better direction. So, so I just want to thank you for your part in that and for everyone listening their part in doing that. And I think it all really ultimately just comes back to our own heart and living our lives in a really good way and uh, keeping, keeping that positivity, keeping that good, that nourishing the good in, in life, in ourselves and in what's around us. So, um, so I just want to thank you very much for the opportunity to share things that are close to my heart with uh with your people here so thank you what he said <laughs> thank you thank you thank you i uh look forward to continuing the conversation and can't wait to hear from my people how much this course that you're about to put out will touch their lives so i thank you all for mm. being here i ask that you please pass the word about empowered at last and together bringing all of our gifts as Sage just said, showing up in practical ways in our immediate lives is how we will make a difference in the world. So I will close this session as I do every week. Choose well, live fully, and by all means, be good to you. Take care, mm. have a great week. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Before we close, I wanted to encourage a couple of things. Number one is to go to ronbaker.net. There you will find lots of clues for how you can deepen this conversation. You can also find a way to get the booklet, An Essential Guide to the Nine Nurturing Needs. 
this is going to be a core focus of how we're going to enhance the quality of your life from the inside out in all the episodes. So I encourage you to go there to get an overview of those nine nurturing experiences that we all seek more than any other thing in our lives. I also want you to get involved in the conversation here. I really would like to talk about the things that are important to you. The things that you're concerned about or excited about. We live in a wacky world that is changing constantly. We need to learn to connect to ourselves, to count on ourselves, and to count on one another. So please either get involved at ronbaker.net or in the Facebook page, which is Empowered at Last with Ron Baker. I look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to deepening this conversation about life. And I close as always, choose well, live fully, and by all means, be good to you. Have a great week.